Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome listeners to another show in the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. Today, we're going to be delving into the complexities of navigating grief and trauma in today's fast-paced world. How do we stay connected yet when we often feel so disconnected? And I'm absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Carl Nasser as our guest today. He's a distinguished expert who brings a unique perspective to this very subject. He has a background in engineering and a doctorate from McGill University. Dr. Nasser combines technical expertise with a deep understanding of the human mind. And as you know, listeners, this is a topic I adore and I'm passionate about. Dr. Nasser has an upcoming book, which will be released in 2024. And it's called Born for a Better World. And this explores the pressures and isolation that arise in our society, particularly in our post-COVID era. I'm certain Dr. Nasser's insights will shed light on how we can find relief from the exhaustion and the disconnection that's so prevalent in our modern day lives. Now let's Let me introduce you to Dr. Carl Nasser. Welcome, Dr. Nasser. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here with you, Anne. What a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much. And I think this is a topic that is very timely, especially as we go into the holiday season where our everyday lives don't even feel normal anymore. We're it's almost as if we're two, we're split, we're two people getting ready for the holidays, attempting to attend to everyday lives. So how can we even begin to process any grief, let alone trauma that may be present for us? Can we start there? It's a bit of a heavy topic, I realize. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I want to go to, I'd like to start with something you said in that, the split that we feel. Um, you know, Um, we know from the field of psychology, psychology has been telling us this for well over a hundred years. We know that we are born for each other. Uh, We know that from the moment that we leave our mother's womb and enter into this, this beautiful, terrible world of ours, (laughs) we know from, we know from that very moment that infants are relationship seeking and that longing for relationship doesn't abate in infancy. It doesn't end with childhood. It is a lifelong longing to have our relational needs met by each other, right? And we know from neuroscience how, that, how true that also is, that our brains light up in, in caring contact with each other, and that we are literally, we literally have neural networks in our brain that, that hardwire us for each other. Yeah. Um, and part of what happens is, you know, um, for most, we know from anthropology that for most of our time on this planet, for most of humanity's 200,000 years living here, those needs for relationship were beautifully met in the context of a village. Um, these small, we were born with 40 pairs of eyes greeting us, 40 pairs of hands welcoming us. And we had this wonderful sense of uh, belonging that came to us from the time we were born. Um, and so we know that very much for all of us back, back for all of humanity for such a long time, we very quickly felt a sense of worth because we know that for humans, when we see uh, the warmth and the affection people have for us, we very quickly feel worthy. Um, but 
um, for most of well, for all of us now, I mean, starting a few thousand years ago and accelerating a few hundred years ago, the, you know, villages of the world were mostly overrun and we buy what, what some writers call a monoculture and what has become the consumer culture, which is prevalent in everywhere. And so on the one hand, we're born for relationship, but the culture we live in pulls us in a different way. The culture we're in says, um, you have to make it on your own. It's quite a contrast to life in the village where we survive together. So we feel somewhat isolated. The culture also says that we need to prove our worth, usually on economic terms. It tells us the questions that matter most are, what do you do for a living? How much money do you make? What part of town is your house in? Um, these are the sort of questions it values. And so the culture pulls us toward proving our worth through what we do and what we have. And this is the split I hear you talking about. That on the one hand, there's this innate longing that we have for each other um, that is very much there, that is very much summoned by the holidays that say, slow down, come together, express your love through gift giving, um, you know, sit by the table and and have this intimate open dialogue. Um, and then the pull of the culture that says, uh, you know, hurry up, uh, do more, make more, be more. At that table, tell your family how, what you've accomplished this year and set out your goals, what you're going to have make happen next year. Uh, and so there is this split inside of us in, in these ways. For sure. Wow. Okay. Let's go back to the village. <laughs> yes. Let's go back to the village. Let's go back to the village. I really love that thought of having 40 pairs of eyes raising us. And I really don't believe that we were meant to have a mom and a dad and the, the nuclear family that we have or a single parent raising a child on their own was ever meant to be the norm because... A child needs a specific set of attention. And if mom or dad is distracted, that child is going to pick up on that and take it on as a meaning that perhaps I'm not that worthy. And that's where all those wonderful attachment theories, which we'll leave for another day. Okay. But if those needs aren't getting met in childhood, we're going to bring those out into the majority of our relationships, I believe, to attempt to get those re, uh, those needs met. That's beautifully said. Yes, I think that's exactly right. You know, so what ends up happening for us in a consumer culture, as you've just pointed out so eloquently, is rather than those 40 pairs of eyes reading us, just one or two pairs of eyes do. And as you said, what happens is these are people who themselves are exhausted, isolated, living in this consumer culture. And there's no way they could possibly meet all of our relational needs. There's no way they could possibly meet all of our, attuned to all of our emotional needs. And so here we are suddenly finding ourselves as children with these unmet needs. And perhaps our parents are so busy, they can't deal well with our sadness. And when we're sad, they say something like, stop your crying or I'll really give you something to cry about. Um, or perhaps they can't deal well with our anger. And um, they get angry at us when we're angry. And then what happens to us? Well, as kids, we, as you said, we think it's us. We think it's our fault. And all of a sudden, instead of a sense of worth, what we have is what we carry instead of some shame. We carry shame about these parts of ourselves. And so what we do is we split ourselves in two inside of ourselves. We take the parts that our parents or significant others in our life reject, and we push them away. And we try to hold on to only the parts we think are good, the parts of our parents that will make us good girls and good boys, and maybe get us to earn their love. And then we're stuck all of a sudden trying to navigate life with only parts of ourselves, um, which, is, which is a very difficult, a very difficult, painful thing to have to do. Well, it's almost as if we've got to be on guard, haven't we? Okay, will I be accepted if I say this? You know, what's the reaction going to be? So that sort of fuels those parts that we've, I guess, deemed as being bad and don't want anything to do with it. And going back to that other, I believe you mentioned that we're growing up in a 
society where good grades, be a good girl, be a good boy, stick in at school, get good grades, get (laughs) the good job, get promoted, get the C-suite, and so on and so forth. And there's been study after study. Um, I think it comes out of the positive psychology, probably a lot of others, where you reach a certain ceiling of uh, income and your happiness does not increase, does it? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's fascinating. So what happens is we suddenly don't have this innate sense of worth that mm-hmm. we would have had in a village setting. And we start, we carry instead a shame and a doubt about who we are. And then the culture steps in and it says, don't worry, I'll help you get your worth back. And it, it primarily tells us how we can do that in two ways. One promise is, look, if you get good enough grades, if you score enough goals on your soccer team, uh, right, your teachers will like you, your coaches will like you. Um, you can earn your worth back by being, by doing enough. Um, and of course, in adult life, as you point out, that translates to, you know, um, a, a profession that is you know, admired or generates a lot of income. Um, but, and, and the other part the culture says oftentimes is, look, if you just, um, well, as kids, we were exposed to about, about 40,000 TV commercials a year. That was in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, and the commercials share a very particular message. They say, look, if you just have the right stuff, if you just have the right toy, then your parents will go outside and play with you. If you just have the right video game, then your friends at school will come over and hang out with you. You can actually, by having the right stuff, you can buy your way into being worthy to be played with and hung out with again. And so we get hooked on these on these false notions that we can earn our worth through what we have and we can earn our worth through what we do. Uh, but as you pointed out, um, those don't work because worth comes relationally, both with our relationship with ourselves and with the relationship with people around us, not from what we do or what we have. And we know that as you're pointing out through studies like the ones that show that if you look at emotional well-being um, and uh, you look at income level, that once you cross a little bit past the poverty line, it really doesn't matter how much more money you make, your, your emotional well-being is flatlined based on income. It depends on completely separate factors. And then I would imagine other needs take over and that sort of leads to those um, I'll be happy when statements. We're always right. putting our happiness off. All right, we're getting ahead of ourselves, or I'm leading. <laughs> <away>. <laughs> we will deal with happiness uh, in a moment. So, in this fast paced culture, you've set the stage as to um, how we've arrived at where we're at. Somebody going through that sense of isolation, going through a sense of loss, how can we build our self-worth? Let's perhaps explore yeah. that a little bit if we can. Absolutely. You know, the contrast between how we used to deal with grief, how we attend to grief and loss and sorrow today um, is significant, but it also was a guidepost to what we can do today to deal better with grief and loss in a more meaningful, connective way. We know that in the village settings uh, that we lived in for so many tens of thousands of years, um, that in most of these villages, when someone grieved, when there was a significant loss, the village would stop. And they would just, everything would pause, everything would grind to a halt, and they would sit with the person who was grieving. And they would be the safe container into which all this grief could unfold, could fall out into. Could you imagine if grief came and the world just stopped for you and everybody just sat around you in a circle and just to hold you emotionally so yes. all of this could come out of you? Yeah. And then after those days where the, where the acuteness of what you were feeling could be cathartic, could be felt, it wasn't that we thought you were done grieving. Then then the most much of the village would move back into what it needed to do, but you would be freed to have what they, we might call it your time in the ashes. Mm. To have your time, your responsibilities would you'd be freed from the responsibilities of everyday life so that you could move through that grief. You could pull 
a village elder or a friend to be with you when you needed to. You could join back in with the community when you wanted to. You could leave and be on your own when you needed to. There was the freedom to go through the grief process in, in, a, in a way that allowed you to um, make grief a part of the process of life mm. instead of having to separate grief from the rest of your life. Yeah. And I think that's what we've done so readily. There isn't time for our grief. It's no wonder we want to push it away because how many companies allow one or three days when there's a death? Then there's the funeral and there isn't the time to even get over the shock of that loss. And the funeral is supposed to be the celebration or the ending in, of one life, beginning of an, another life. But there isn't time to transition. We don't have those people available to us. We often feel we have to be stoic at the funeral. We don't want to see people um so we're not a, a hot mess we have right. to hold it all together because we don't want others to feel uncomfortable how can we get back because i think that village is a very healing way of dealing with the grief how can we sort of find ourselves back in that space so that we have that time or Let's go there, and then I'll ask my awe question. Okay. <laughs> See, first, I just want to agree with you. I think that we very much live in a culture that tells us in many ways, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicitly, not to grieve, that we're told as children, don't cry over spilled milk, uh, that we're told as adults, uh, when the going get tough, the tough get going. Um, there are so many messages that tell us that we're supposed to be we're supposed to tough it out in some way. And we're really not, yeah, we're, we're asked to put on almost a, a sort of forced happiness. Then when we're asked how we are, we're supposed to say, I'm okay, or I'm all right. Or at, at most, it's tough, but I'm getting through it. Um, it it's sort of self-reliance. But the dilemma is grief was never meant to be managed all by ourselves. Grief has always been meant to be shared. I mean, if humans arrived on the planet with any one instruction tattooed on their forehead, it would be do not leave alone in case of grief. We mm -hmm. really are meant to be able to take our grief and share it with each other uh, because sharing our grief is a remarkable, remarkably important thing. Um, when somebody grieves, um, there's a level of rawness, of vulnerability that evokes a tenderness in us, a compassion in us, and bonds us very much together. Um, we create in that moment an instant village where we've come together as two people who are right here for each other, loving each other. You in taking the risk of sharing your grief and me in being the container it's been a, who's going to hold that with compassion and care. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the, the piece for us is to find those people who have shown themselves to be deserving of that level of vulnerability, of that level of intimacy, and to take the risk to share with them what our culture so often tells us not to share, that we should be the fun one, the life of the party, not the one that, quote, brings people down. Um, but we're not bringing people down. We're inviting them to love. And there's nothing more important than that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the other flip side of that, when people see somebody grieving, it evokes emotions within them and they don't want to allow those. So it's like, all right, we'll just pretend I don't see the person or I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Or if I say something, I'm going to make it worse for that person. But that's not the case, is it? It's actually allowing you to meet at a heart space i think that's what i heard you say when you when you feel safe enough to be vulnerable and not judged in that moment and for that other person doesn't necessarily have to say anything it's no, the person's hand eh? 
Yeah. You, you know, I think that's something that is uh, so important. We don't have to know what to do with a, someone who's grieving. But we have this idea that we can only approach somebody when we know what to do. But the truth is, we can just show up with our hearts open and just sit down next to them and have no idea what to do next. But our intention is loving. We're coming at sitting from a loving space and just being there in that space and then allowing whatever happens to happen from there is mm -hmm. so important. Yeah. I mean, in a funny way, that that's therapy, right? I mean, that is what we do as therapists, as grief coaches, <laughs> is we sit with people and we don't know what's going to happen. You we, know, don't we don't know. No. Somebody walks into the therapy office, sit down on the couch, and I have no idea what's going to happen in that hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, my intention is to sit with them, as I know yours is, hearts wide open, and just allow whatever comes to guide us in discovering what love looks like for this hour exactly and help them untangle some of those beliefs that you sort of brought up that society puts upon us okay i i think my all was we can seek support but if somebody doesn't have that support that person that died was their support person what sort of things especially going into christmas we're all going to be family orientated and there's so many that are going to be left behind what might yeah. they be able to do yeah you know um this is where there's some risk taking involved uh, because what were we asked to do is reach beyond what we're what the, um, the comfort of what's familiar uh, and find within our culture those spaces that make room for our grief, whether that is, um, you know, um, at the hospice that holds uh, grief groups, whether that's in, on, on my couch in my office or in another therapist's couch in another therapist's office, um, it is to, or whether it is to see what's possible with the friends you have and explore where you might push the edges of those friendships mm -hmm. to allow for that extra support. Um, but we're, we are asked to grow beyond our comfort zone in those moments and to reach out into the world and take some of those risks. Because what's very important for us to discover is that we are still very much loved. Beautifully said. So it's trusting and taking a risk that the, there are groups, there is somebody out there that you can reach out to. And it, the growth would be in allowing yourself to do such rather than sitting and attempting to deal with it on your own. Yes, I mean, you know, we, um, we have all learned uh, in different ways that relationships can hurt us. And we've all been hurt by relationships, whether it was with our parents early in life, as we talked about before, or whether it's later in life, what happened with partners or friends, we've all been let down. And of course, we're all scared we're going to be let down. And we might still be let down. But the reality is, is life is worth the risk. It's, and relationships are worth that risk because we will find in among them the people that can really love us. And they are worth the effort to find. For sure. Thank you for presencing that because I believe that could be something that holds a lot of people back is the judgments. Yeah. They've been hurt earlier in life and it's allowing yourself to step beyond that and allow yourself to be vulnerable because I know Brene Brown's done an amazing job on the vulnerability <laughs> And it's not a weakness. And it truly takes guts and courage to allow yourself to be vulnerable and let it be okay if you're let down or your needs are not met in a way you anticipated. Um, yes, yes. And, you know, it, my hope is that we as people will find each other again more and more. Uh, that we will come back to form modern versions of our ancestral villages 
where we won't have to live in the isolation of our culture. We won't have to do every, so. We won't have to live so much of our lives on our own, taking care of so much of life on our own. Yeah, as you say, we're not meant to be. Going back to, I would imagine what your book is going to be when it comes out, um, Born for a Better World, will have some of these strategies in, will they, on how to cope? Because coming out of COVID, it feels like we were born back into a world that we no longer recognized. Even our work culture has changed. Um may have taken us a little bit of time, like an animal coming out of the den, looking to see <laughs> if the world is safe before we right. start to join, you know, with friends or, or networking groups and what have you. Is that a result of us having gone inwards? Do you see that as a result of? It's interesting. You know, I, I wonder for COVID if part of what happened was People were very busily living their lives in ways that they weren't always so satisfied with, that they were tired, they were exhausted. Mm -hmm. COVID came and it forced a pause on much of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, when, we, when we started to ramp back up again, there was the sense of, I don't know that I want to go back to what I had before, but I also don't know what else is possible. Um, and if this is my only choice, then I guess I have to go back into this. But I, I have this felt sense that people now feel more than they felt before that this is not the world they want to live in, where they are, they are worked tirelessly, where they are uh, taking care of household chores and children. And um, by the end of the day, they have so little energy left uh, yeah. for what they most cherish. So by the, uh, the world taking that pause, it allowed people time for reflection to see what was working and what wasn't working in their lives and how can they do better. I guess that's where there's been a lot of the mental health issues, the divorce rates. It's almost as if that created yet more of a pandemic coming out of it because we haven't yet decided what we want our lives to look at. We just know that's not what I want anymore. Would that be a correct assumption? Yeah. You know, what, what I, what I, um, what I hope people will hear in part is that we can build a pathway to what I believe we really want, which is a life shared with a community of people that genuinely care for us where we feel our security comes less from building our own individual pile of wealth and protecting it, but our security comes more from a sense, of, a sense of mutuality, a sense of I care for you and you care for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about this, that in our culture, if we were to start a company and the company had um, two people in it, we would think, well, that's a very small company. It's a very high risk. You should hire more people. Because by the time you have 50 people in the company, well, then the company is, is a safer company. It's not so fragile. And yet we ask people to live um, in, in a family with one or two working people. And it's a very fragile place to work. It creates a lot of insecurity, a lot of anxiety. What if we could find a way to come together in a way that we could lean more on each other, yeah. trust more on that interdependence? And as a larger collection of people, really um, form these communities of care where we are not so alone and isolated and we are able to feel a sense of, I am safe because I am cared for by all these people. And the relief we might feel knowing that we don't have to, um, we don't have to protect ourselves from the world. We can just allow ourselves to be a part of this larger family that we've okay. created. Mm -hmm. Right now, looking at everything that's going on in the world, I, for one, think your idea, um, connecting with others, having more love, is a beautiful way. And I hope in my lifetime, I'll get to see communities be that way. 
how far out sounds awfully utopian but how far out does it start with us does it start with us reaching out to our friends and creating that kind of a world what are your thoughts there yeah two, two thoughts so first there are intentional communities throughout the u.s canada europe um there are in the u.s i believe it's somewhere between 100,000 to 300,000 people that live in intentional communities, which are communities of about, call it 20 to 50 people that have chosen to live collectively on, uh, in a collective collaborative way. Some of them are in shared buildings in Saint, downtown St. Louis. Some have bought land in rural Missouri, um, but these are people that have found a way to do the work of living together uh, supporting each other. And what you see, which is fascinating from these groups, is that if you look at the life, there are life satisfaction surveys and, and the scores from intentional communities are among the highest scores ever recorded for life satisfaction because it meets that longing for each other. Now, that's what's already there, but most of us, you know, 350 million people in the US, you know, uh, 40 million people in Canada, most of us are not among the hundreds of 300,000 living in those communities. Mm -hmm. So for us, I think it starts with just the simple acts of being able to learn how to slow down our lives in a way that we make room for the people around us more. And we learn to deepen those friendships. And we learn to do what the culture often tends to diminish. Our culture tends to tell us to hurry, to work, to hurry home, to cook, um, and friends are what fall in the gap. They're sort of inconvenient because they don't show up at the right times in our, our lives. They need us when we don't, when we're busy. Um, and it is learning how to, uh, how to make room for those relationships uh, in a way that allows us to grow our sense of connection and our circle of care. Sorry, I'm laughing at that thought because we've had some friends we've known for a while that just say, oh, just pop over. And uh -huh. my husband and I have this sort of ongoing angst about, well, what if it's inconvenient? <laughs> they said, oh, right. just, just pop over and we can't. So there's that. How can we, how, what would you say to me if I'm having that just pop over or, oh, I, it's supper time. We, you know, what are my friends think they're doing showing up at my doorstep? <laughs> we've, we've turned it yes. into a, an awkward situation. Yeah. It? Yes. It, it's, yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, you know, I, I transitioned from being an engineer into being in the field of psychology and becoming a professional counselor and a therapist. Yeah. And, um, you know, as an engineer, my work was very much on a computer and, uh, you know, a paper and pencil. And um, when I first had clients arriving at my door, I thought, what an interruption to my work I'm doing. You know, I'm supposed to be planning and scheduling it. And here were these clients who needed a whole hour of my time to just sit with them. And I had to, you know, all train myself, say, no, this is the work. This, and it's so much more beautiful than getting busy in front of a computer on a, on a pad of paper. Um, I think that's the same thing that's true about friendship. Mm -hmm. That it's very much about, um, in some ways, um, training ourselves to welcome the interruption of friendship. There's this lovely story, um, this wonderful study that was done um, I, you know, I can't think of what university was done at, but it was, they took a group of um, seminary students mm -hmm. and uh, they said, okay, you guys are going to do, uh, they, they, broke, they, broke, they broke the class into two halves. One half was going to talk about the story of the Good Samaritan, which of course is the story of this person on the side of the road who's suffering and a couple people pass him by, but the Good Samaritan stops to help him. And the other half, they say, you're going to talk about the future opportunities for seminarians. Um, and that's going to be what you present. And then they, when they came one-on-one -on -one to their presentation, they said, oh no, we've decided to record your presentation. So you've got to go to the studio uh, on the other side of campus. And to half the people, they said, you know, you have to hurry, you're late. They're, they're going to start without you. 
And to the other, and to the other half, they said, you got all the time in the world, take your time going over there. And as they walked across campus to the studio, what, what they had, they planted, they planted an actor who was laying on the side of the road, you know, acting like he was in pain, he was suffering. Now, what they found was the people who were going to talk about the Good Samaritan or the people that were going to talk about the, um, you know, their future careers, there was no difference in who stopped. Um, but the people that had to hurry seldom were told to hurry seldom stopped. The people who were told they had time slowed down, stopped, took the time to help. And this is what's so important for us to believe that we have the time to be in relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that we don't have to hurry past these because we're too busy for I think what we all most want. What a beautiful story. I was uh, wondering how I, I could intertwine your engineering with what you're <laughs> doing now and you did it beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yes, what an inconvenience having a client show up. Good right. <laughs> <laughs> so that just sort of goes back to our beliefs and our values you valued as an engineer having that space and that time to work on problems and now flip the coin you've got a client and you realize that I it's need the to switch yeah. mm -hmm. switch my mindset yeah. what's more important here <laughs> and I think that's important for us all perhaps to learn to shift, to sort of look at our expectations, would you say, just as you did? What was my expectation as an engineer and what was it as a counselor, as a therapist? And I think we, yeah, I think we've lived all the way back to the beginning where we talked about that split inside of us, okay. that we innately long for connection with each other. Mm. But our culture has told us that our worth will be found in what we do and what we accomplish. And so we get busy hurrying to do, to accomplish, to get more likes on Facebook, to get more sales at work, to get whatever it might be. And then we lose track of what we, of what we really most want and where we would really find our worth and our value. Is that sense of belonging? Yes. Yeah. Oh, how beautifully said. We haven't even mentioned the book. I think we need <laughs> to present your book. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> what is the message? What is it you hope the reader will take away from you when they get to read your book? Yeah, it's a very personal book for me um, in so much as it conveys, it not only tells some personal stories, uh, but it also um, is the message I most need to hear. Um, that, you know, that I can get caught up in the rush of what this culture wants me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like I get pulled out by this almost riptide of busyness out into the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Um, and I free, and then there are times right before bed, the world is still and I can feel the stirring. No, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't what you most want. This isn't really what you really long for is just to sit down with Anne and have a beautiful conversation with her. What you really long for is just the time to spend with your wife and your daughter and your friends and to build a community where this is what is, what is valued most of all. Um, and so the book talks about um, how did we get here? How did we go from villages into a consumer culture? And what happens inside of us as people when we're, when we're asked to live in this way, what have we lost? Um, and what, uh, what have we been told is important? And then it, and, um, and then it, and it, it talks about the grief that we carry around being so isolated, about being so tired, uh, about being so left alone and into that place, having the, the losses and illness and deaths that fall onto us in the middle of all of this. But then it also talks about how do we find our way back? How do we learn to slow down? How do we learn to welcome back the parts inside of us that we pushed away so that within us, we have an inner village where all our parts are welcomed back and we make room for all of who we are. And in parallel, how do we go out into this world and make room for all the people around us so that we can 
not only feel whole within ourselves, but whole around us with relationships and, and a sense of community that really gives us a sense of belonging again. And that's the key word, that sense of belonging. And I think that's possibly what we're all looking for, isn't it? Where do we fit in? Where do we belong in this world? Yes. Yes, it's what we um it's what Ram Dass had said, this idea that we're all just walking each other home. That this is really what we want. We just want to come home to each other and feel like, ah, oh, I'm safe, I'm loved, I'm seen, I'm known. And from here I can be all of who I am. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful words. So it was a book that you felt you needed to write to be a reminder to you. <laughs> to very, very, very much so. I will tell you that this audience of one is very, very much enjoys not only the process of writing the book, but then of reading it. It is a, it is really a gift to myself to, mm -hmm. uh, to write this and share this with myself. And then hope, as I put it out into the world, that it touches other hearts too. Yeah, for sure. What a humble way of putting it as opposed to, well, this is going to be a bestseller and I'm going to get all this recognition and my therapy practice will be, you know, full to the roof. Right. Which this is, is what we started the conversation with in our market consumer type of world. That would often be... The motivation, would you say, behind it? Sure, right. The, this this book will, you know, I'll be known, I'll be seen. Everybody in the world will say, oh, look at Carl. Oh, he's the guy that wrote that book. And I'll, I'll sit down at the restaurant and they'll look at the back back jacket of the book, holding my books in their hand and go, oh, let's go get a, let's go get a selfie with him. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, while I think, I think, um, you know, uh, well, I think that there's surely a part inside of me somewhere that thinks, oh, how fun that might be. Okay. Uh, I think far more than that, um, I would just um, prefer the genuineness of this touching people deeply um, as opposed to just the volume of how many books are sold. Yeah, exactly. I just presence that because... That is one side. And I just loved how you were so humble. And I could feel that it was a genuine authenticity and, and heartfeltness that people will get value and be able to begin to find their own sense of belonging, find their own communities. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and from there, feel a sense of, look, there's a lot happening in this world outside of us. Um, you know, this is, this is a tough world to be a part of. It isn't easy. It's beautiful and it's terrible. And both those things are true. And the terrible scares us and the beautiful inspires us. And all that's real. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lovely quote from someone who lives in community now. And he said, look, he said, all these awful things still happening in the world are still happening in the world. Just because I'm in this community doesn't mean they've stopped happening. But it does mean I don't have to be scared alone. It does mean I don't have to go through it alone. It, I'd much rather go through all these things happening with people around me with whom I can talk about this. We can hold hands together. We can decide what we want to do together. And there's something um, comforting about feeling like, okay, this is happening. I don't just have to read it on, um, you know, on my iPad and mm -hmm. then turn my iPad off and just carry the weight of that inside of me with nowhere for it to go. And I again believe that if we could perhaps limit our exposure to what is happening in the world is that a good thing or is that wanting to turn a blind eye does that is that helpful yeah i think you're talking about something so important that there is this lovely middle road you know for us to walk um uh, you know that we don't want to turn fully away from from everything because then we don't know uh, mm -hmm. But we also don't want to overwhelm ourselves in a way that we then can't regulate what we're feeling with it. To the extent that we can allow ourselves to have a time when we feel ready to sit down and look at the news in, what, in whatever way, in whatever form we want to, and, mm -hmm. and allow, us, allow it to touch us, 
allow ourselves to really feel what we're feeling as we read these stories that might very much break our hearts yeah. uh, or very much scare us. Um, and to just and to just hold those parts of ourselves tenderly as they mm-hmm. come up. And then to say, okay, that's enough for now. And to close it and to be done. Um, so that we are being very genuine in the experience we're having as we look at what is so hard to see in the world around us. And also to remember that this is not the whole story, that all around us are also people like Ian who are doing their part to try to make the world better in all the small ways they could. Um, I remember when there was um, uh, there were some difficult things happening here in the U.S., and at the time I was running a counseling organization and I would travel to small towns to meet with people a bit, to talk about how our organization could support that community through counseling. And I met with all these people who were doing all of these things that were small in scope, but so big in heart. And I felt so touched to look at all these people who could have been doing other things. These were smart people. They had master's degrees. So they had gone back to their small rural towns to run a small nonprofit, and they were making next to nothing, but they were happy with where they were and what they were able to give back to their community. And that this is happening all around the world as well, even if it doesn't make headlines. Yeah. So it's getting back to those, what really is important to us is the community and is our friendships and that sense, as you say, of, of being with others just want to cycle back because you mentioned watching what's watching the news let's go there yes. sure. and allow yourself to witness it be aware of what it's provoking what emotions are coming up yes. and instead of changing the channel instead of rushing off and doing something else just give yourself that moment to feel to feel yeah. those emotions is that what i heard yeah yeah i mean i like the imagery of um taking this part of me that is scared or yeah. sad and uh, and just imagining putting this part on my lap and just sitting with this part of me and just saying i'm here of course i'm sad that's the, how human of me of course I'm scared. How human to me. Of course this part is here. You are welcome here, sadness. You are welcome here, scared. Or maybe something outraged me. You're welcome here, anger. It's okay. This is part of what being human is. And I just want to make room for these to be here as a part of this process instead of have to hurry past it and push it down quickly. And then it comes out sideways later with people I care about. Yes, exactly. And is it your experience that when we sit and allow the emotion to, you know, for us to either put it on our laps or or to genuinely feel it, that it dissipates pretty quickly? It's not going to take us down, is it? If we allow the emotion in? Right. Yeah, I think that's an interesting fear, right? That if I allow something, I'll get trapped in it. And then I'll be stuck. Then I'll be, you know... If I allow the grief, I'll grieve forever. If I allow the sadness, I'm sad forever. Um, Instead of, this is just another part of who I am. This is just another part of my inner village. This is just another villager inside of me with a story to tell. Something that that, that this part of me wants to say something to me. It has something that wants to be heard. And I want to hear this part. I want to understand what is it? And I want to be able to say, okay, I, I hear you. I get it. I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, because it is a way of tending to ourselves in a way that keeps us a little bit less lonely. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing that. I think that will be very helpful for our listeners who may be grieving at this moment um, and alone that it's okay to sit with these parts. And it sounds almost as if you are being the loving parent and that part that's in your lap is is the scared, frightened child. And you're perhaps being the parent that that child may have longed for all, all, of, the, all of their lives. 
I love how you presence that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I really hope you have found some valuable insights that will be able to inspire you listeners in a way that can really connect and enrich your lives, especially as we go into this holiday times. Is there any last words you'd like to leave us with, Dr. Nasa, for people going into the holidays? How can we how can we take care of ourselves? Because I think it starts with us, does it not? It does. And, you know, two things. First, Anne, um, thank you. I'm very grateful for this time with you and for you as a person and for you as a gift to the world. Thank you for taking this time for me. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being who you are. I very much appreciate that. And that ties very much to the holidays, right? That we, that we that if we could, part of this part of what slowing down also allows us to do is it allows us to also see what we do have that we often that we often move too that we often move past too quickly to see that we have um so i think part of it for the holidays is slowing down to see what we have appreciating that and as part of that making sure we slow down to see the relationships that are around us and to really take the time to be uh, take a few small risks there to share a little bit more of who we are, the people that are safe enough to do that with, so that we can be seen and loved in more and more ways. Beautiful. Allow ourselves to be seen and loved in more and more ways. Thank you so much for your beautiful words. It's been a pleasure spending time with you. And as you know, I was very excited <laughs> when we first met just to, to be able to bounce ideas and share our love, our love of the human spirit in all its messy moments. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending time with us today. Thank you, Dr. Nasa. You're most welcome. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. And we'll make sure that we put all links to Dr. Nasa's book so you'll be able to discover when it's released, if that is something of interest. And of course, they'll all be in our show notes. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at Anne at Understanding Grief. Dot com, or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>